be here now. Just be here now. Welcome back to Mind Rolling. This is Raghu, and uh, I wanted to intro this uh, episode, actually a couple of episodes that we're going to present. And uh, recently we were in Maui for the first time in a couple of years, and two years since Ramdas passed. And we were, of course, gathering together, um, honoring Ram Dass, and uh, it was called Legacy of Love, actually. And it'll be a retreat for those of you who are interested. Make sure you signed up. You are signed up at uh, ramdas.org, a mailing list, email list, so that you can get a notification, get all of our notifications. We have some really wonderful things happening in 2022, and uh, one of them will be the sessions from uh, this Legacy of Love Honoring Ramdas retreat. As part of the retreat, though, I did a mind-rolling uh, podcast session, and I had the wonderful opportunity to have a co-host, Ramdev, Dale Borglum. He's on Be Here Now Network and does a fabulous job uh, with his podcast, and uh, we were also very fortunate to zoom in both Roshi Joan Halifax and Sharon Salzberg. So the first part of this uh, podcast, which is what you're going to hear right now, is with Roshi Joan Halifax and, of course, Ram Dev. And uh, we were talking about some of the gifts that Ram Das has given us over these decades and continues to give through this wonderful archive that we have uh, under Love Serve Remember Foundation. So uh, this was uh, totally a delight for me to hang out with these guys. And um, the part two will be with uh, Sharon Salzberg, and she spent the, the whole hour with us, actually. So I'm really happy to present these uh, two sessions from the retreat as uh, part of our podcast um, output, so to speak. And uh, I think you'll enjoy both of them, but uh, here we go. And it's, it's interesting because it's, of course, the beginning of 2022, and what a great way to start uh, with these really phenomenal teachers and good friends of mine. So really happy that this took place. And here it is, part one. Again, my co-host is Dale Borglum, also known as Ram Dev, and uh, featuring Roshi Joan Halifax. So tune in for part two next week. On Mind Rolling, on the Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and catch all of the wonderful thought leaders, presenters, and teachers. See you then. It's exciting to me that we're going to have Sharon Salzberg and Roshi Joan Halifax over this next uh, couple of hours. Because they were a very big, big part of the retreats that we have here and have had for many, many years, and just uh, being with Ramdas, coming here. You know, I'll ask Roshi about that. She'll tell you about her, her yearly visit outside of the retreat to visit Ramdas. I get stopped a lot because of the Be Here Now network and all the podcasts and so on, and how it has been so important to many, many people as well as those of us that are doing it. And I just thought, you know, Jack, of course, has a podcast along with Ram Das, the Here and Now podcast, and Krishna Das, who's here now, and uh, somebody gave me a whole list. And of course, 
Mirabai Bush just started a podcast, so somebody else great to listen to. Ramdev, sitting right next to me, has a podcast. And then we have a guest podcast that Trudy and Nina and Mirabai Starr and Roshi Joan uh, are regular part of. So uh, beherenownetwork.com, just go there and uh, just navigate through and see whatever tickles you. There's also a, uh, an Alan Watts podcast which is great. And the first one we did with Alan, uh, we did a podcast where we took material from both Alan and Ramdas over a certain theme, and they went back and forth on it. It's fascinating and incredible, actually. So that's something else to enjoy. Um, there's so many great things that are on this thing. I'm, I'm just thinking of one. There's a great Tibetan Lama named Minjur Rinpoche, uh, whoever may know of him would know what I'm talking. Uh, Krishnadas and I have done a couple of podcasts with him. Uh, and the last one, it, it was, first of all, the connection was like it was with Duncan, who was just, you know, on the East Coast. This was in Kathmandu, and it was perfect. And he is so beautiful, and uh, just a, a shining example of uh, loving awareness, actually. <laughs> So, and you can see it on, because uh, we put the podcast up on YouTube, so you can actually uh, see him and not just hear him, which is really a, a treat. So, um, Roshi's going to come zoom in here in, a, in about 20 minutes or so. So, we'll, uh, when she does, we'll have to get it set up. So, there's, I just wanted to uh, bring up. You know, we were thinking, what is uh, originally thinking about what the theme of it, of this retreat is? It was legacy of love, honoring Ramdas. And then I also started thinking about all the uh, that legacy has so many gifts to it. So I was thinking about all the gifts that we have been given by Ramdas, and of course we've been talking about them. His innate wisdom around all the themes here from dying and death, love and death and compassion and service. But uh, I wanted to get with uh, Ramdev and talk a little bit about maybe more of what I personally got in the very early days of meeting Ramdas that maybe we haven't really talked about. And the one I was uh, totally thinking about, it was honesty, his self-honesty, and his sense of humor about our predicament, personally, individually, and collectively. And those were two huge things for me when I first met him, because his honesty was extraordinary in terms of talking about his foibles and all of the stumbling that he did on the path and as a human. And... Uh, when I first met him and started listening to his uh, talks, it gave me such a sense of ease. Oh, it's okay. It's okay to be human. I mean, I love uh, what Jack says from time to time in that uh, beautiful, caring voice of his. It's okay to be human. And that's what I got from Ramdas that it was okay, and uh, not be embarrassed by all of the stumbling, etc. And then, of course, he was so funny, you know, and he made, he made it light for us, he really did, by that great sense of humor. So, I know there are no more of these left that just came out. It's words of wisdom from Ramdas that Rachel Fisher put together. And uh, somehow all the boxes didn't come in, but you'll be able to order it just by going anywhere uh, from Amazon to Ramdas's uh, shop. But I just thought I'd give you a little bit of that characterizes Ramdas's connection to that kind of honesty. And he said, at a certain point, you realize that you only see the projections of your own mind. 
The projections, projections are your karma, your curriculum for this incarnation. You are living in a universe formed from your projected attachments. That's what we mean when we say you create your own universe. You are creating that universe because of your attachments, which can also be avoidances and fears. As you develop spiritually and see how it all is, you keep consuming and neutralizing your activity more and more. Truth is one of the vehicles to work with. What I've learned is to use my lecturer role to make my truth as available as possible. I find that people say, thank you for being so truthful. It makes it easier for me to be truthful about myself because you've done that. And I think Ramdas is saying this. I think, well, it's a cheap price to offer yourself up for that purpose if it begins to help other people. So, yeah. Truth. How do we get really, really honest with ourselves about our, our selfish motivations, etc., etc., our judgments, our shame, all of it? When I first met Ramdas, I, I was really a yogi. I was a graduate student. I was not enjoying being a graduate student. Uh, I was swallowing cloths, moving them around in my intestines. I was standing on my head for long periods of time. No. Yeah, really? Was, yeah. Fruitarian, uh, intense breathing practices. And when I met Ma uh, Ramdas, I keep saying Maharaji for some <laughs> reason, he, he, was, he was channeling Maharaji, and he was really able to talk about the difference between yoga and tantra. In yoga, you try to control what goes out of your mouth, in your mouth, how you breathe, how you move, how you control things. And Maharaji was a lot more about worshiping everything. It's all the mother, it's all God, including the places in ourselves that we don't love. So that his honesty, his Ramdas's ability to talk about his own foibles freed me to go beyond trying to be a better yogi and to be able to admit my feelings of inadequacy, of arrogance, of all those emotions that we're trying to use our practice to get away from. And the big paradox in the spiritual life is that we come to practice to get away from suffering, but the more we push suffering away, the more we uh, begin to use our practice to push suffering away, the more we're caught in this war with suffering. So that the more we can lean into suffering, the more we can accept it, the more we can uh, be gentle with those parts of ourselves that we've been trying to defeat and push away, then healing begins to happen. Ramdas would quote this, this uh, little fable by Sri Aurobindo. And Sri Aurobindo said, I was walking down the path, it was a muddy path, and God knocked me over. I fell into the mud, I got up and said, why are you knocking me over? What are you doing? I'm all muddy now, look at this. And I was very upset. I got a little further down the path, God knocked me over again. I got muddy again. I got up. I was still upset, but not as upset as the first time. I just said, okay, stop doing that. Third time, he knocked me over. She knocked me over. And I just got up and kept on walking. And Ram Dass went on to say that that ability to be with those places in ourselves where we see that we're having a hard time accepting and as soon as we see them, come right back to the path. Uh, I have a friend who, it's a kind of a long story, I'll make it really, really short, but he was trying to do some compassion practice for his father, who had been very difficult for him in his life. His father had died. His father had literally been a Nazi. He had been a uh, guard in a camp in Eastern Europe. And he called up and said, I've been trying to do compassion practice for three days for my father. I just can't do it. I thought maybe you could help me. And I said, well, what you need to do 
is do compassion practice for the part of yourself that doesn't feel compassion for your father. Mm -hmm. So that wherever we find we're caught, instead of continuing the battle in that moment, can we trust the mother? Can we trust God? Can we trust that even difficult emotions are the path, that every step, every event along the way is the perfect next step on the healing path? In Tantra, the more difficult, the more intense the emotion is, the greater the opportunity for awakening. We're not trying to make everything even and yogically calm it all down, but kind of saying, bring it on. That there's, there's not only the beautiful side of God, but there's the wrathful, there's Kali and there's Shiva, and there's, there's the, the destructive parts that, that transform. And in the West, we usually think of God as somebody nice we'd like to have cocktails with. I mean, <laughs> Jesus marries somebody nice and sweet, but who wants to have cocktails with Kali? Who, who wants to get... It's a new book. <laughs> it's cocktails with Kali. Cocktails with Kali. There we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, in terms of being able to really connect with truth inside yourself, realizing what motivations you may or may not be having around self-interest, etc., as, as we just discussed. So the methodology uh, that Ramdas used in, in the very early days after he first came back from India uh, was, uh, is ubiquitously known as mindfulness. Right. And he called it the witness. And he got, didn't he get that from Gurdjieff, right? And, uh, partly. Yeah, yeah. partly. Yeah. And uh, the problematic thing, either with mindfulness or the witness, is where it's emanating from. And that's why, in the, you know, is it your head that's just sort of judging everything? You, oh, you shithead, you're just doing this for yourself. You know, that kind of thing is as useless as not even being aware uh, but um, Ramdas, in the last years, as those of you who have been especially to these retreats, so emphasize loving awareness practice. And uh, that practice uh, is really uh, extremely central to being able to navigate honesty in, as far as I'm concerned because it the uh, purview that you come from from that which is not judgmental it is not the mind ego thought it, it is actually a practice that puts us into our heart space and from there we can see the stuff but we are not judging it we are not ashamed of it we are not guilty of course, we are all of those things, but that loving awareness, even for a few moments where you're actually in a place where you're not jumping all over yourself, allows some kind of uh, burning away of attachment. And I think that that's an extremely important gift that Ram Dass gave us, no? Important gift. So... Maharaji kept going sub -ec, which is a great idea, but when somebody cuts you off in traffic or you're having a hard day or you're really being down on yourself, uh, is that part of the one? And this inner truth is being willing to be with any emotion. Emotions aren't good or bad. Every emotion has a healing message to it. And I think that's what Ramdas is really getting at as the wise psychologist that he really was. Mm -hmm. That instead of controlling things, that if we're really receiving it all as grace, I remember uh, he came up with this slogan in India. He said, fear, comma, no faith. Faith, comma, no fear. So whenever you're feeling afraid, afraid of what you're feeling, the fear is greater than the faith. And there's, there's two things you can do at that point. One thing you can do is you can increase the faith by going into your mantra, remembering Maharaji, or you can decrease the fear by doing these Buddhist practices of being 
having an embodied mindfulness. What does it really feel like to be afraid? What does it feel like in your body? Can you investigate that without judging yourself for being afraid? And when I used to do a lot of long meditation retreats, I was like really into Buddhist meditation. I was so neurotic. I thought, this might be my salvation. Even when my mindfulness got very, very strong, there was a voice in me that was judging how my practice was going that was impervious to mindfulness because that was the voice of survival. There was a kind of a superego in there that was running the whole thing that was very hard to be aware of because mm. I thought that was me, right? And Subak is really asking, who is this one? Who is, who is judging the emotions? Who is, who is judging other people? Mm. That's why Ramana Maharshi is so great, right? What some of this uh, leads to in terms of being truthful with oneself and coming from a, a place where mindfulness really is mindful and not judgmental, uh, I think we also have to bring in the, just the basic idea that how much we are defending the quote-unquote me that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, Krishnadas calls it the movie of me. You wake up in the morning, you're the protagonist, the villain, the director, the producer, 24-7. And when you can uh, finally realize that, and then you start to see how much you're defending that me, me territory, uh, then you start to understand what is commonly called today spiritual bypass, right? Which uh, a great teacher of, of both of us and many of us back in the day was Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche. And he used to talk about it in terms of spiritual materialism. So just using spirituality as as a way to feed the ego, which was being fed by, before by something else that we didn't call spirituality. Right? So, uh, the penchant we have to protect our, this is, I want you to consider here, we can ask Sharon about it as well, the penchant that we have to protect our territory and that me, me, uh, is very, very strong. How do we deal with it in terms of, of, of trying to be uh, honest with ourselves? You get it? Yeah, I do. Okay. I was just trying to think of the most clever way to respond. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a while. Yeah. I mean, to me, it really comes back to having a curiosity, a uh, willingness to be truthful and really admitting how suffering is being created rather than blaming the environment for the suffering. Am I suffering because of Donald Trump? I mean, I've been facilitating these groups. We talk a lot about compassion. And for four years, there was this magic trick I had. I, all, all I had to do was say, when you are dying, Donald Trump will be at your bedside. <laughs> and everybody freaked out. <laughs> yeah. But, I and wonder. any place that you are going to automatically react to that name is going to be there when you're dying. Or if you're a Republican, you love him and you're grasping at that. That's going to be there too. So that sense of, of being willing to really admit that sense of grasping how suffering is created and bring your heart to that is the practice. And here is Joan. Uh, who is somebody who is extremely important in terms of what, we don't even know what we're talking about, Roshi, but hi. <laughs> Say hello. Oh, we're not hearing you yet. Yeah, but he, they're fixing that. So we'll just give you the t context. We, we were talking about the gifts that we've gotten from Ramdas, 
uh, all through this retreat. And one of them that I thought we should really bring up amongst ourselves was the way in, how, in which he was so honest with himself, right? In the early days, that was a big boon for us because any dark thought we had, we'd stuff that away, you know, and uh, this isn't spiritual at all. So Ramdas's honesty and his uh, constant uh, reflection on, remember the witness? now called mindfulness, and he, he embodied that. And he gave us a way to at least deal with it on a, on a fundamental level. So we were talking about that, and we just started talking about that in relation to uh, spiritual materialism as a way to defend our me territory. So that brings you up to speed. Well, kind oh. of. Oh, <laughs> there you, you are. Much. There you are. Okay. Um, but Roshi, so we're talking about um, the gifts that we got from Ramdas, and uh, I know that you used to because I, I would come as well, and we'd spend time at Ramdas's house. And you used to—I won't give the you know the the line away. But why did you used to come visit Ramdas? Well. You know, it was an annual pilgrimage, so I could propose marriage to him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, every time I would say, you know, year after year, I would come and sit, you know, at the breakfast table, 90 degrees across from him. And I'd say, Ram Das, will you marry me? <laughs> and he went, no! <laughs> <laughs> but the last breakfast we had, uh, before he dropped his body, he proposed to me. And I went, no! <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you know, there was a I, medical... You know, we just... Uh, the thing about him, mm. um, you know, he was just a big tease, a cosmic tease. And, um, you know, he wasn't self-righteous and he was always, um, you know, making fun of himself and of uh, people around him, but never maliciously. Um, always in this kind of enlightening way, because he saw so clearly through us, through our pretenses and through our fears. Mm. So big gift, big gift. Now, you used to talk about a certain procedure that was performed when you came to Maui, to Ram Dass's house. A transplant of some sort? A what? Transplant? You would say... Oh, hey. oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, actually, I, it's very funny. Uh, so, you know, I said, uh, uh, you know, Zen... I mean, actually, I was just writing today. I have to give a talk on uh, the San Sui Kyo, the Mountains and Water Sutra by Ehe Dogen. And there's one uh, piece of the fascicle where Dogen talks about love. But, you know, the Zen thing is not very lovey-dovey, and per se. And so uh, I would tell R.D., you know, I come here annually for my heart transplant. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's always um, in the, the retreat, you know, while you are doing the winter retreat, which I would love, had loved to have come to, but it's during our Rohatsu session. So I snuck out of the session uh, at 6.25 and uh, logged into, you know, this wonderful occasion. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, this, this opportunity to um, uh, uplift Ram Dass's legacy you know, in our different ways, I think is really important because he gave so much to us. Uh, you know, um, my own work in the prison system was completely inspired by him. Mm. You know, I wor worked as a volunteer at the penitentiary of New Mexico uh, for six years on death row and maximum security. And it was really following in his footsteps. And... Um, Knowing that, you know, I knew nothing about what it meant to be, you know, a guest of the prison industrial system. 
but I learned so much. And one of the things I learned was to love everybody, mm -hmm. no matter how egregious the, the actions that had brought, you know, these men or a man into uh, death row. And I heard all their stories, but um, it was always coming from love and coming from kindness, you know, really trying to channel Baba's spirit, you know, in the stinking urine filled uh, halls of that institution. And, you know, the same with um, uh, uh, those of us who worked uh, and still work with dying people, you know, having your mortality right in front of you as you, you're bearing witness to supporting a dying person is just an incredibly powerful practice. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, working in the prison system, I always thought, you know, I'm one thought away, no more than one thought away from being inside myself, you know, not inside myself, inside, uh, you know, death row and maximum security. Mm. Just, you know, a, a slip and there you go. Yeah. So I'm just so grateful for RD um, opening these paths for us, for myself and Dale Borglum and uh, my beloved Frank Ostaseski and others of us who, who have worked in these charnel grounds and been, you know, uplifted, learned so much and to realize that we're not separate from that dying person or that person on death row. Mm. A large part of uh, for the different, uh, that is sort of the connecting tissue of the different themes that we've been presenting. One has been around compassion, one love and death, and the other uh, service and social action, which are three core uh, gifts, if you would, legacy of Ramdas. Uh, and uh, that is interconnectivity, the absolute, the way in which we are not separate and the way in which Ramdas continued to work his entire life on closing down the idea of separateness by virtue of his, finally, of course, loving awareness meditation because that's where it has to start. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, um, I think that the, the trius of love, serve, and remember, um, it's it just really important. You know, this experience of love really is based on the realization of us belonging to each other. Mm -hmm. And I always, when I was with RD, I, you know, I always felt we belonged to each other, but, mm -hmm. you know, so did everybody else belong to him, and he belonged to them. And there was this sense of, of profound entrustment that um, one experienced with, uh, be, you know, being with R.D., um, that uh, there was this um, letting go, deep letting mm -hmm. go. Um, which made it possible, I feel, for um, the second part of Love, Serve, Remember to um, be actualized because, well, I, I love what Rachel Naomi Remen said. She said, you know, um, uh, let's see, helping, fixing, and serving are three different ways of seeing life. When you help, you see life as weak. When you fix, you see life is broken, but when you serve, you see life as whole. Mm. And that is for me so, uh, um, so much at the heart of what um, RD brought to all of us as a teaching in, of practice actualization, where um, we come to this radical realization um, that to, to love, is um, to actually um, be in this state of profound entrustment. You know, our presence uh, invites entrustment. 
and um, how we are with the man behind bars or the, the woman who's dying. Again, it's the experience of entrustment. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, um, the remember part is interesting because actually, uh, you know, from the Buddhist perspective, and we always teased each other a lot of, about this Buddhist Hindu thing, but <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's kind of like a Jew and a Christian having a fight about what's real. But, um, you know, the remember part for me wasn't just about um, uh, the lineage per se. It really had to do with this experience of recollection of, of what it means to, to be fully present. Um, and that was something that uh, I, you know, I think all of us, you know, Baba had his moments when he could be a little grouchy and everything, <laughs> but mostly he was um, very present, often without uh, access to um, language. And he taught us how to listen. He taught us how to slow down. And he taught us how to remember in the experience of deep presence. Mm, yeah. Be here now, 50th anniversary it is, yeah. No kidding, be here now. <laughs> but boy, our, our here and now is pretty out there. I think, you know, Baba dropped the body right before the pandemic. Yeah. And I, I was thinking, um, you know, when he left, boy, you sure left just in time. Yeah. <laughs> you we all say that, yeah. Really. Left all of us here to, you know, Keep the keep on keeping on. Mm, yeah. Of course, you know Mr. Dale Borglum, Ramdev. I was actually facilitating a, a retreat with Joan the day that Ramdas had a stroke. Yeah. And Joan oh, got you're the kidding. phone call, and she told me that Ramdas had a stroke and he might not live. Oh. Wow. I remember that moment very well. Wow. We've been through it. Really? Thoughts? Uh, well, right. here's your perfect opportunity. See how beautifully Roshi is attired and present. Perfect timing for Ask the Roshi. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, what's happening is I turn 80 this year. So no. that's, uh, you're you know, kidding. I, 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 I'm almost to that finish line, or maybe it's the start line. But, you know, Rohatsu session ends on the 8th of December. And uh, I was thinking about Dasima because I go to the hospital on the 9th to have a knee replacement. <laughs> Dale, I'm sure you can uh, relate to that. Um, finally, uh, my, my knee gave out in the mountain walking. So, oh, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm gonna be, you know, a little bio more bionic uh, uh, in this, uh, you know, next phase of my life. Join. Joseph Goldstein said that the Buddha had a bad back. So I don't know if that's true, but it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that um, we often said was uh, aging is not for sissies. Mm. But I remember R.D. would um, just tease the hell out of people who came in complaining about their various physical ailments. And he says, no, 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 organ recital. No organ recital, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... Boy. Anyway, uh, he certainly had his own incredible physical challenges. And I, I just have to say, as uh, someone who served and, you know, was a, a kind of uh, uh, example of, you know, vitality and health, and then after his stroke, having, you know, the tables turned on him, and learning how to receive care and ask for what he needed, also a great lesson for all of us. Yeah, big time. Uh, 
You know, you probably won't remember this, so I won't even get into it further than we were doing a podcast together many years ago with Duncan, who was with Jack today through Zoom. We had, they had fun with him. And I said, look, you have spent so much time with Ramdas over the years. And constantly during that time, Maharaji is a ever present through pictures, through stories, right? And I said to you, what, so, you know, coming from the tradition that you are coming from, you talked about this, no, Jews, Christians, this is a duality plus in terms of bhakti, devotion, the path of devotion versus the path of Zen. And I said, well, how do you perceive Neem Karoli Baba. I'm not going to say, I'm asking you now, so how did you perceive him when you saw him or when you heard or whatever? All those years. I don't remember what I said. Obviously, you do, so maybe you can <laughs> remind me. Okay, I'll remind you. You said, when I look into his eyes, I see he is empty. That's what you said. And then we had a discussion around the path of bhakti versus the path of, not necessarily the path of Zen, but non-duality or beyond the two. And uh, we had a good time playing around with that. But um, Ramdas used to say that his practice, the Buddhist practice, and including deep meditation retreats that he went to, allowed him to be able to open up his heart way wider because of, the, of that practice, one-pointedness and absorption. Can you talk, talk about that in, in your own experience related to uh, that practice and related to just opening up one's heart to the world? It's a wonderful, wonderful question, Raghu. You know, in... In Zen, there is one-pointed practice. There's, you know, concentration on the breath or on a koan or some other object of meditation, which has the uh, effect of uh, allowing for a kind of down-regulation. Um, and then from that serenity or that calmness, um, we're able to perceive things, perceive reality, and, you know, more clearly in an unfragmented way. And it's out of that perception, I think, that the feeling of love arises or joy arises. Mm. Or, the, you know, it's not um, being, you know, in a non-dual state doesn't mean that you're turning away from the world. You're part of the world in a way you have disappeared into the landscape of the world, or you're in this intersubjective field, and that field is characterized by love. And um, it, it's love that is selfless, uh, it's unconditional, it's unfabricated, it's unmediated, and um, uh, it's, there's no out there and in here either. So, you know, I think many people uh, look on emptiness as a kind of, or voidness, mm -hmm. um, as a state that um, is, uh, you know, kind of cold or flat. But um, even in Ehe Dogen's work, um, when he's speaking about this, uh, or writing about this experience of non-duality, um, it is fundamentally an expression or realization of love. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. And you know, I think that for me, um, in being with R.D., he, his relationship with um, Neem Karoli Baba was, you know, a vehicle in a certain way into uh, the bliss of emptiness. And you know, it, it was just one of those things. In a certain way, I'm, I'm not the devotional type. So, you know, it was always like when he would talk about Baba, it would be like he's talking about a boyfriend or something, you know, with this kind of 
lovingness. But I, after, you know, sitting at the breakfast table for years, um, I came to see things really differently. That um, uh, it wasn't, you know, like a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It was not personal in a way. It, it was really transpersonal. It was all embracing. And it was that quality which R.D. shared with all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in a, actually, in a seminar we did one day at uh, Ramdas's house with you and Frank and Ramesh, I guess, he was there as well. Uh, he was asked, uh, what's your experience of Maharaji? Sort of a, just a simple, direct question. And he just, you know, he just kind of closed his eyes and set his head back. And, and then out of him came, he was so empty. He was just empty. And that recalled back, and we all had that experience, which was exactly how you described it. Within that realm of no of non-duality, which he was living in, that was obvious to us. There was no subject to object. There was no one doing anything, quote unquote. Within that realm of emptiness, it was just the complete uh, inevitability of there being only one quality left, which was love. And that's what we as kids were sitting around at that time. So, yeah, that to me is the way these two paths come together. Beautifully, actually. And we were fortunate. Really beautiful. Yeah. We were fortunate to have that uh, common, this is something you can address as well, perhaps, to have that combination of heart-opening practice and, and uh, discriminating wisdom that's represented in the tradition that you're in and Jack's in and, Sharon, you know, and all of our quote-unquote Buddhist friends is really special. So to, to me, it seems you can do it two different ways, that you can become so aware that the heart opens, or you can go so deeply into love, and as you're going into love, you have to become aware of what it is that's blocking your heart, and that the emptiness of the heart, the spaciousness of the heart, is really empty only in the sense that it's empty of self that reveals the profound fullness of the heart itself, that whether we call it consciousness or we call it love, when Maharaji says sub -ek, it's all love, it's all consciousness, it's all one. And there's all these pictures behind us of deities that we can worship. At the same time, they're representations of qualities of consciousness that we can be aware of moment to moment to moment. So in my own path, being a recovering mathematician, it was very, very necessary to plunge into awareness enough to quiet down that analytical mind, that mind that needed to categorize and to begin to reveal the heart at the center of the lotus, the jewel at the center of the lotus. And then I would dive into devotional practices, but I would need to keep coming back and see how my, my concepts kept getting in the way that I didn't totally trust the empty nature of self, that this, this leaping into the abyss again and again and again, uh, I could do it for a while and then, then it revealed another layer of fear that I needed to open my heart to something I hadn't even known existed. So that... Uh, there's this teacher, Deepama, you maybe have heard of her, who she's a, a very traditional Vipassana teacher, and at the end of her life she said that there was no distinction between metta, loving-kindness practice, and awareness practice, because if she's aware of anything, of course she loves it. And if she loves something, of course she's aware of it, that they, they really became 
one and the same practice. So that whether you start mostly on the awareness side or mostly on the devotional side, they have to come together. That's beautiful, Dale. I love the I love the way you say that, and also um, I, I also you know uh, uh, bringing up Deepa Ma in this way, you know, in her realization at the end of her life to see that so clearly. I I hope we can have that realization yeah. before we're too close to that horizon. Mm, big time. Yeah, yeah, big time. Big time. Beautiful way you put that, Dale. Mm -hmm. Thank Dale. Wonderful. This, I just caught a, a little thing Ram Dass said once that I just made a note of. Uh, talked about becoming an environment where other people can come up for air. Oh, we love that. That's so great. And that's really what he did, especially in, in these last years here in Maui, last 15, 17 years, whatever it was. Uh, you we know, were... I'll never forget the last time that uh, Ram Dass and Frank and I taught together. Frank and I, you know, flew into the Maui airport, and um, uh, oh, RD God. was, <laughs> you know, in the ICU, just, you know, being discharged to a room, and when, you know, he and Frank and I arrived at the hospital, and it was like, oi, <laughs> and we're, you know, texting back and forth, looks like we're going to have to do this without RD, and, uh, you know, so we planned a whole alternative program. And then um, RD got discharged uh, later in the afternoon and came home. And next thing I know, we're all three, you know, heading to the, the church. And, um, uh, you know, he wasn't in great shape. I mean, he had such bad edema in his uh, arm and leg. And oh, my God. And I thought, this is nuts. And yet he, it was one of the most powerful or the most powerful experience of darshan really? that really? I've ever, ever been through. You know, there, was, there were no words. The three of us just sat on that stage with him, uh, you know, holding love and emptiness. Uh, mm. pure awareness, loving awareness. It was, it, it was really extraordinary. Wow. Oh. Imagine he comes out of a hospital room and goes to a public event. I know. I mean. That, you know, one of the things that I think was very characteristic of him was that he showed up. Yeah, yeah. The guy showed up. Yeah, big time. So hopefully we're doing a little showing up here, all of us. You can't see uh, everybody in the uh, audience. But uh, yeah, there's a bunch of showing up going on here in this moment, especially with what we're going through. Yeah, so we're, everybody's happy to be here. We got a little bubble, so we're doing okay. Well, it's just about time for me to sign off. Um, okay. Sharon is waiting. You want to say hi to Sharon for a minute? Yeah. This is so fun. <laughs> We've never done anything like this before. Uh, hopefully, yeah. she'll be here in a sec. Uh, but, uh, you know, and Dale, it's great to see you again. You too. It's been a long time. Um. Just hey, so, girlfriend. Hi, I'm not, this is so exciting. Oh, I yeah. know. Look at this. How cool My is gosh. this? Hi, Sharon. Hi. Ramdev is here. Dale is here as well. Hey, Ramdev. Hey there. I'm Maharaji behind everyone. <laughs> so we just been hanging with Roshi for a while, but I thought she'd want to say hi to you. And she has to move on to other things at this moment. So, Roshi, thank you so much for being here, really. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. Just love to everybody. And it's an honor to uh, bring the memories of my buddy forward and also to share this moment with all of you. Thank oh. you. 
Thank you, Roshi. Bye bye. Sharon, see you later. I hope so. <laughs> we have to catch up. Uh, I know. We won't do it. Talk now about it. No, we no, we don't ever want to do it in public. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. So now, these from, are the two mischief ladies. We make mischief. Too. Oh, you do. Yeah. Good trouble, as John Lewis called it. No. That's it. <laughs> Love you. Bye bye. Bye. Love you. Mm.